today, uh, we're still working with the binomial probability distribution. We've learned how to identify, we've gone to binomial PDF and CDF, how to calculate probabilities. And today we're going to look at the parameters for a binomial distribution, the mean and standard deviation, and use that on several problems. And then I'll going to hand you out a worksheet. To refresh your memory, when we started talking about discrete probability distributions, remember the whole chapter five is about discrete probability distributions, and the binomials just are a primary example. But there are, in general, when we start out, we just generally talk about discrete probability distributions, and we define the mean as the sum of x, p of x. x is your value of your random variable, p of x is the probability of having that value as an outcome. And sigma squared, this formula. And we calculated a few uh, means and standard deviations using our favorite one bar stats. Do you remember how to do that? One bar stats, L1, L2, to calculate the mean and standard deviation. Well, that's all well and good, but if I ask you, let's find the mean of a, the following binomial distribution, I'm going to flip the coin 500 times, what's the mean and standard deviation? If we use this technique, I'd have to come up with a table 501 probability values, perform this calculation, and then come up with the mean. That's kind of tedious, isn't it? And you think by now, hundreds of years of mathematicians being kind of lazy people will come up with a shortcut. And we tend to be, and we did. That's what we're going to go over today. It's basically short formulas to find the mean standard deviation and that's the variance, and the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, for a binomial distribution, just for a binomial. And there they are. The mean is simply n, the number of trials, times the probability of success. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Let's go back to an example we used so many times. Flip a coin 100 times. So it's a fair coin, so P would be 0.5. The outcomes in that experiment are 0 through 100. That's the values of X random variable. What do you think the mean should be for that experiment? What makes sense? What would you say the mean number of heads would be in 100 tosses? 50. You'd say 50, right? That's N, 100, times B, 0.5. Makes sense. But we're not going to actually prove these through derivation, but I just want you to get a sense that that's intuitive. I make n times p, yeah, you know, when you start to think about it, that's what I want it to be. And that's what it actually is. Probably not quite so obvious that the variance sigma squared is n times p times q. Well, that's pretty easy. That means the standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q. So we don't have to create these huge tables and go through these complicated calculations. If we know just the basic facts about binomial distribution, we can very quickly find its mean and standard deviation. Uh, these formulas are going to be on your formula sheet. But there's problem. You probably should commit these to memory, too. That's not asking a whole lot. But it is there as a backup on the formula sheet. All right, what we're going to do today, there's not much to calculate these, and that's not really what the class is about. It's how do we use this information? So what? Now I have the mean and standard deviation of binomial distribution. What would I do with it? Other than answer some questions that my professor asked me, right? There's a lot of actually very useful things we can do with these parameters. And we'll go back to this idea of what is a usual or unusual result. We have two ways of doing that. Uh, one is plus or minus two sigma. Now we said that's good for any, just about any probability distribution. If mu plus or minus two sigma 
that range of values gives me about 95% of the data values. So that's not a law of mathematics, that's a, that's a rule of thumb. There's my mu, mu plus two sigma, mu minus two sigma, and in general, in general, 95% of my data values would be there. So that means less than 5% to the right and less than 5% to the left. And we've been using kind of casually the terms usual versus unusual. Usual in this range, unusual somewhere out here. All right, this works some problems that we could apply these concepts, some answers. First, a, a simple one. McDonald's is a worldwide brand name, and it is claimed that 95% of the people, will say the people in the United States, recognize the McDonald's brand name. All right. Is this anything like a binomial probability distribution? I'm going to select 12 people and ask them, do you know McDonald's? Is that binomial? Yes. So Barty, let's go through the questions. What are the three questions we ask ourselves? Uh, is there success and failure? <coughs> okay, so what's the success in this case? They know McDonald's. Great. That's the first affirmative. We need two more. Is it are they connected? Are they connected? Uh, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a Take that case. Fix number of trials. Okay, fix number of trials. In that case, that's going to be 12. I got one other important piece of information. Okay, Russell. Does the probability change? Exactly. The probability of success has to be the same for each trial. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. That's why I'm randomly selecting people. The fact that one person knows who McDonald's is probably doesn't impact what the next person is. So it's reasonably they're independent. Fixed number of trials, two outcomes. So I've got a binomial probability distribution. I can quickly calculate the mean and the standard deviation using the formulas. The mean is 11.4, don't round. It's true, I could never get 11.4 persons. I know that. That does not prevent me from having a mean of 11.4. Decimals are fine here. That just, the interpretation is, if I did this many, many times, the average number of people that would recognize McDonald's would be about 11.4 if I did it again and again and again. Now, obviously, at any particular procedure where I ask 12 people, I wouldn't get 11.4. That's not what that statistic means. That means that's the mean. In the long run, what would I expect to get? In the standard deviation, we're going to call it 0 0.8. All right, how could I use that? Well, one thing is to use this uh, range rule of thumb and to get the upper and lower bound of the number of people that would recognize the McDonald's brand name. So that's mu plus two sigma and mu minus two sigma. And I get between 9.8 and 13. How do I interpret those numbers? What about 9.8 and 13? Uh, 13 is the maximum number of people that you would probably find at uh, McDonald's. 13 out of 12, yeah. Uh, but no, it's, it, that happens occasionally that the number we get out of here is actually larger than our n. But that's what that's really saying is you can't get an unusually num high number of people that know McDonald's in this experiment. Even if you got all 12, we would consider that unusually high. Because after all, 95% say they know McDonald's. Right? And what's this number mean? Uh, the minimum amount of people that you probably find at McDonald's. 
Yeah, and how would I interpret this range between 9.8 and 13? And that means? Okay, a bit further. They're normal or usual. They're, okay, they're the usual values. So if uh, I did this 100 times, what percent of the people would I expect to this experiment 100 times? Right. What percent of those outcomes would I expect to be between 9.8 and 13? About 95%. That's what I was fishing for. About 95% of the time, this experiment, asking 12 people to you, you know, this answer, would end up in a value between 9.8 and 13. So to be unusual, it would have to be 9 people or less, unusually low. And as we noted earlier, you can't have an unusually high number here. Out of 12 people, 13 would be unusually high. That would, that would be unusually high. That's impossibly high. But that's an artifact of a very high p-value. All right, now let's practice thinking statistically. And this is going to be a skill you'll be holding in 106. This is kind of a precursor of things to come. I suppose McDonald's has hired us be their statisticians. We all get paid in happy meals or coffee, lattes, or whatever you want. And we run this experiment for them, and we find that seven people recognize the McDonald's brand name. What could we conclude from that result? I can think of two possible conclusions. We're going to say that they over half recognize it. That's true. Well, let's take a, a small step. Is that, would that be an unusual number of people? Yeah. Are usually high or low? Yeah. Low, right? Okay, so what does that mean? How, would you, how can you possibly interpret, what possible ways are there to interpret that number? An unusually low number of people said, I know who McDonald's is. Maybe to ask the uh, you know, people, you know, you get them when I feel like I'm very asking them. It could be if what you, the direction you're going is, well, maybe I just got a strange sample. Maybe I'm someplace, you know, out in the hollows of Rockbridge County where they've never seen a McDonald's. That's possible. I mean, you could always say it's my sample. But what's the probability of that happening? Well, it's not that likely if you did a really a random sample. I guess that'd be akin to saying, well, my sample's not really random. There's a problem with my sample. All right, but what if I come back to you and say, no, wait a minute, we used all the best standards of sampling. All those things we studied in chapter one and two, we got clustering and this and that and all that. How else can I explain that? It's not the sample. What's the question? Then? The assumption that 95% of people recognize McDonald's. How did I get this range of values to begin with? I assume that 95% of people recognize McDonald's brand name. Now, if I do this procedure and I get an unusually low number, I have two choices. I need to say, as we said at first, Weird sample. It happens. Go do it again. So if you did it again and again and again and you kept getting unusually low numbers, what would you conclude being a rational person? That 0.95 is wrong. That McDonald's really isn't recognized by 95% of the population. Now, I know that's kind of difficult to get your mind into that, but that's, that's your life coming up in 106. It's called inferential statistics. And we use these results to decide whether what I've observed is unusual or not, if what I've observed supports a hypothesis or it doesn't. And at the basis of all of it is this idea of a probability distribution and this concept of unusual values. All right.
let's do a couple more problems. Let's say one in 10,000 people have a, uh, an IQ score high enough to be considered as genius. One in 10,000. What is the expected number of geniuses in Virginia with our population? How would I do this? Uh, can I get you to slow down? Don't start touching on the calculator immediately. Let's think it through. What are we working with here? What kind of beast is that? Binomial because, let's, let's describe it, NPQ, NPQX. population of Virginia. So my experiment is I'm randomly selecting someone from Virginia. That's my N. Okay? What's my P? Well, it says 1 in 10,000. So that's tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, tens, hundreds, thousands. That's P. What's Q? Oh. Alright, so before we dive into it. This is just where I so we've got a binomial experiment here. If I'm selecting people from Virginia and, and observing their IQ. Well, how many would I expect to find then in Virginia? And what would the mean be? Mu equals NP. And that's going to be Got calculators. Have it? 788.259. So I mean, All right. So we would expect to find 788.259 geniuses in Virginia. Now I've, I've counted them, there's 820. <coughs> Are we an unusually smart state? We've got more than the mean. Should we start bragging and say, get up out of Massachusetts, you know, defeat liberal intellectuals? We've got it down here. How do I, how do I answer that question? I have to know the standard deviation and how are you going to use it? The range rule of thumb. Well, the way I'd answer a question like this, I'd find sigma, and sigma is the square root of NPQ, so someone work on that for me. Then I'm going to look at mu plus 2 sigma, and I'm going to look at mu minus 2 sigma, and I would say then 95% of the IQs should fall in this range. Okay. What's my mu plus two sigma? Eight forty-four, and then it's seven thirty-two. So, after all, would you be justified in saying Virginia is unusually smart? We have more geniuses. Now, unfortunately, we can't make that claim. We're right like within that range of usual values. All right. Let's Wait, do one. Um, the sigma is just n p q all put together as the square root of it. Yeah, n times p times q square root. And it'd be twenty-eight. Yeah, twenty-eight point oh seven. Mm -hmm. All right. One more example. Let's say the historical free throw percentage for NBA players is seventy-five percent. And uh, what's the expected number of free throws made in 20 attempts? That was quick, and how'd you get that? Well, I did, if it was 10, then you talk 7 to 10. If you have 7 and a half, times 2. Yeah, well, that works. So. 
So you are assuming we have what kind of probability distribution here? Um, binomial. Binomial. And let's just convince ourselves that's the case. Now, yeah, today I'm talking about binomial distribution, so chances are the example is going to be binomial. But in the upcoming intellectual challenges that I've prepared for you, they'll be mixed and matched with other kinds of distributions. So it's worth taking a minute and just let's convince ourselves this is binomial. And binomial, let's describe it, n, p, and x. So what's n? All right, what's p? And what is the meaning of x, my, my random variable here? The number of free throws made. Does this satisfy the condition? Does this description satisfy the condition for a binomial? Fixed, two outcomes, either you make it or you don't. Probably the percentages are independent. You might argue, well, you know, if I have an injury, more likely to make successive uh, misses, but it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be outrageous to assume independence. The probability is always the same. All right, now back to the question: How many free throws would I expect to be made in 20 attempts? Translate that to the equivalent mathematical statistic or parameter. What's another way of what? How would we state that in statistics speak? Yeah, we're asking for the mean, aren't we? Or the expected value. Remember I said mean and expected value are synonyms here. So the expected value or the mean, and this is binomial, is n times p, so it'd be 20 times 0.75 or 15. All right, would it be unusual for a player to make at least 18 free throw in 20 attempts? Now there's two ways we can answer this question. We can use the plus or minus two sigma rule, or we can use the probability rule. Let's go through both of them. Let's first do the plus or minus two sigma rule. What else do I need to know here? I need to know sigma. All right, what's sigma going to be? Okay, can someone calculate that for us? What's the standard deviation? 16.431. 16? Maybe Yeah, that's too high. Standard deviation is 1.9. Do you take the score root? Yeah. NPQ, right? Uh-huh. Q is... Oh, and it's X. Yeah, Q equals 0.25. That... So here it's a 1.94. And I do the plus or minus 2 sigma down at the bottom, and I get 11.2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 18.88. So if someone who made 19 free throws, that would be unusually high. Would 18 be unusually high using this method? No. Would uh, 12 be unusually low? No. Would 11? Yes. Yeah, 11 would be. Okay, let's do it using the probability method. And then the definition of unusually high or low is there's less than a 5% probability of that happening. So I'll look at it this way. What's the probability of having 18 free throws in 20 attempts? That's the probability of x being greater than or equal to 18. All right, when I have a greater than or equal to in this binomial, I use the complement, don't I? Because we don't have a calculator function that works with a greater than or equal to. So what's the complement of greater than or equal to? 18 <coughs> less than or equal to? 17. Then one 
minus that, it would give me the probability of x greater than or equal to 18, I get 0.091. So it, using this technique, is 18 unusually high? No, because the probability of 18 or more is 0.091, which is greater than 0.05. I'm just be cautious here. I, in answering that question, I looked at the probability of x greater than or equal to 18. Not just equal 18, but greater than or equal to 18. And that would give me, that's the cool one to looking at this mu plus or minus 2 sigma range. But those are two different techniques. They'll usually agree. They might not always agree, but they usually agree. All right, any questions? Now I'm going to put you to work. Is that a question or a scratch in the ear? What's a scratch? All right, let's do a worksheet.